Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Thursday. Is it just me or do these seem to get earlier every morning as we go through the conference? Yeah. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Dave Steffen. Um, I am a principal software engineer at SciTech. We are a small aerospace and defense company. Um, we are very, very much hiring. We've got a, uh, an office up in Boulder. It's about 40 miles northwest of here. So, um, so if you're looking around and you're local, or if you're not local and you think that being even closer to those nice mountains you can see out of the hotel windows, uh, you might check us out. So this talk is about unit testing, and it's about one specific area of unit testing, making your tests better at testing your code. Unit testing is a big subject. There are many aspects to this. This probably isn't even a complete list. Um, this talk is very much about that last one, making sure that your tests are doing a good job of testing your code, because that's kind of the fundamental point. You get a lot of other good things out of doing unit testing, but if your unit tests aren't doing a good job of testing your code, you're gonna have problems, because it's a bug hunt. Now, the question is, how many of you recognize the quote? Do you know where that comes from? I'm seeing a couple of nods. Yeah. So I started at SciTech about four years ago, immediately got put in charge of a dev team for the first time. Uh, and everybody on the team uh, just about was a young, new, fresh grad straight out of college. And we had about half a million lines of legacy code dumped on us. And it didn't take long before something really nasty showed up. And I looked at the team and I said, all right, people, it's a bug hunt. And I got dead silence. Nobody knew what I was talking about. And no joke, that was the first time I felt professionally old. Because the movie I was referring to was older than most of the people on my team. So just so we all know what I'm talking about, this is what a bug hunt is. Morning, Marines. I'm sorry we didn't have time to brief you people before we left Gateway, but... Sir? What is it, Hicks? Hudson, sir. He's Hicks. What's the question? Is this going to be a stand-up fight, sir, or another bug hunt? All we know is that there's still no contact with the colony and that a xenomorph may be involved. Excuse me, sir. A, a what? A xenomorph. It's a bug hunt. What exactly are we dealing with here? This, of course, is uh, James Cameron's 1986 masterpiece, Aliens. Maybe not the high point of Western civilization, but for a certain generation of people growing up, it's, it's up there a little bit. Now, before we go on any further, all right, this is CPPCon. There is a code of conduct. You heard about that on Monday. And the point is that this has to be safe and fun and comfortable for everybody, right? The conference has to be rated G in movie terms. Well, maybe parental guidance suggested, right? Some of that stuff about undefined behavior might not be suitable for young children. It scares me, right? I, but uh, so uh, Aliens is very much rated R. It's a horror movie and a war movie and all kinds of other stuff. And I know that many of you, maybe even most of you, don't like that kind of thing. So we are going to see a couple of clips from this movie. But trust me, they have been very carefully edited. Uh, there's no violence. There's no gunfire. And there's almost no aliens. Um, so uh, this, this should be enjoyable for everybody. Um, but the reason we're going to watch this is because this is actually an excellent example uh, and has a lot of good lessons for unit testing. If for no other reason that you don't want your bug hunts to go like theirs. <laughs> Spoiler alert, the movie's about 36 years old, I can do spoilers now. Their bug hunt doesn't go well, right? It goes very, very poorly indeed. We don't want that. So, um, now I've been saying this for a while and we'll keep saying it. Um, modern software testing and experimental physics are basically the same thing. Um, your CPU is a physical system displaying very complicated quantum mechanical behavior. We set it up with some very complicated situation of electrons and voltages and stuff. It does something. Our unit tests are basically lab equipment to poke at it and look for certain things. So um, physics had to revamp its underlying philosophy in the 30s and 40s. Uh, the point is that we generally can't prove a physical theorem correct. All we can do is try to prove it wrong and fail to do so. Uh, so when Dijkstra, back in 70, writes that program testing can be used to show the, show the presence of bugs, or can never, sorry, can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence, he's saying exactly the same thing. 
right? We cannot, in general, prove that our code is correct. Maybe we can prove certain functions correct. Maybe in rare cases, we can prove a whole program correct. But in general, we can't do that. So we have to settle for the next best thing, trying hard to prove that it's wrong and failing to do so. And our confidence that it's correct tracks how hard we've tried to break it. So what we're going to do is take a page from experimental laboratory techniques. Um, when you design an experiment, there's a whole list of things you want it to do. Um, for our purposes, uh, these three points uh, are sufficient. Um, it needs to be repeatable. Being able to repeat test results is the core of all science. We need accuracy and we need precision. These are the things that are the armor plate for your unit tests that help keep the bugs out. Now, we're not gonna talk about these too much. Repeatable means that you get the same answer every time you run your tests. Replicable means that your colleagues get the same answer when they run it. Um, we're not gonna talk about this because I spent 30 or 40 minutes on this at a not entirely dissimilar talk last year called the unit test strike back. So go see that one for an extended discussion of flaky unit tests. We all have, I'm not gonna ask how many people have flaky unit tests because I know it's everybody, right? The one that only fails every other Thursday during a full moon. Um, so go see that talk for a detailed discussion. This year, we are going to be talking about accuracy and precision. Now, in colloquial English, these are more or less interchangeable, <clears throat> but uh, in science, they really do have distinct meanings, although most of the definitions you see in science textbooks aren't that useful. Accuracy is something about how close to the right answer your equipment's uh, results are, and precision is something about the statistics involved um, that's actually not all that useful. A more intuitive view uh, and you see this example all the time, is um, if you're trying to measure where the bullseye is. Uh, over on the left, you have high accuracy and low precision. High accuracy in that if you take enough measurements, you will get the right answer, um, but you have lousy grouping. So you probably have to take a lot of measurements to get decent statistics. Um, over on the other side, uh, you have very tight grouping. So you have very precise readings. They're close to each other. In some sense, you get more information out of each one because you don't need to do as many of them to get your statistics right, but you're gonna get the wrong answer. So roughly speaking, accuracy is about your equipment being correct, whereas precision means it's reliable. Now, unit tests are what's called a binary classifier. You don't have measurement error. It's just yes or no, right? So there is mathematical definition of accuracy in this case. We actually don't care. But I'm a physicist, so I have to put some math up here or they take my card away. Um, but uh, we will be careful to define our terms. A positive result out of a unit test means that it has found the thing that it was built to look for, which is a bug. So a positive result from a unit test is it fails. A negative result means it passes. Now, this is, this is not the emotional result. I'm not saying you're happy to get a positive result, right? This is more like your COVID tests. Right? The positive result doesn't make you happy. It means you have to stay home. A true positive here means that your test fails because there's a bug. And a true negative means your test passed because there aren't any. A false positive means your tests fail in the absence of a bug. So you have a false alarm. And a false negative means that they pass, but there are bugs that are going to make it through to production. Um, again, we don't care about the math too much. But when you hear people like Titus Winters say things like this, that tests should only fail because the code under test fails, they're really talking about accuracy. Now, precision for binary classifiers isn't actually mathematically defined, so we'll have to be a little bit more clever about this. But in general, we can sort of, by analogy, say that a high-precision unit test gives you more information than a low-precision unit test does, and we'll nail this down later. Whoops. So, this is all well and good. But no one's gonna think about this when you're writing unit tests. One of the things I want you to come out of here with is a deep, instinctive, intuitive, emotional understanding of accuracy and precision as it applies to unit tests, because that's what you're gonna need uh, on your day-to-day -day work. So let's catch up with our hapless group of colonial marines. This is towards the beginning of the movie. They're deep in the alien hive. Some horrible things have happened I'm not going to tell you about because rated PG. This is the moment at which things seriously start to go wrong for them. Pay attention to Private Hudson, who is the guy with the motion tracker equipment.
Movement! What's the position? Uh, can't lock in. Talk to me, Hudson! Uh, multiple signals. They're closing. Go to infrared, people. Look sharp! What's happening, eh, Pong? Can't see anything in here. Pull your team out, Gorman. I got signals, I got readings in front and behind. Where, man? I don't see He's right, there's nothing back here. Look, I'm telling you, there's something moving and it ain't us. Yeah, there's something moving and it ain't us. That's the great actor Bill Paxton in his first big role. So what you don't know if you haven't seen these movies is that these motion trackers are in fact 100% accurate. If they go off, there's something moving. And if they're not going off, there isn't anything moving. Their accuracy is excellent. And this becomes important later on when all of a sudden one starts beeping and you know that things are not going to improve. But you can see that there is a very problematic lack of useful information. It's saying that there's stuff all around them moving, but they don't know what to do about it. That is a low precision test. Now, you heard Sergeant Apone tell them to go to infrared and they flipped some little thing down. We never see in the movie what that looks like for them. But we actually have infrared cameras in real life. Um, I found a nice shot. This is from back in 2008, the first time the Mythbusters got their hands on an FLIR camera. And so, in contrast, we can see that this is very accurate. If you're searching for the presence of uh, infamous Mythbusters, there's one right there. And it's also very precise in the sense that there's a lot of information. You can see that his hat and the infamous mustache are cooler than his skin temperature. And in this frame, if you look closely, you can see that he's breathing out through his nose because you can see the warm air coming out of his nostrils. This is high precision. Now let's go back to our colonial marines. Presumably their infrared cameras are, if anything, more precise than this. Now pay attention to Corporal Dietrich, who's up on point. Look, I'm telling you, there's something moving and it ain't us. Tracker's off scale, man. They're all around us, man. Jesus. Maybe they don't show up on infrared at all. Yeah, maybe they don't show up on infrared at all. They don't. There's one right behind her. Um, if I can get my mouse cursor over here. There we are. Um, if you don't know what these things look like or you haven't seen the movie, this is its head. Its shoulder is maybe over here someplace. This thing here is the end of its tail. It's curled up in the wall, and she looked right at it. Right. So here we see the exact opposite situation. Presumably, these are very high precision things. We know that infrared cameras are, but it has a distressingly low accuracy. It can't see the aliens because they're cold blooded. This is biologically implausible, by the way, but that's not the biggest problem. Um, the point being that this is what you want to be thinking about when you're talking about accuracy and precision in your unit tests. Accuracy means that when there's a bug, the alarms sound. When there's no bug, the alarms don't sound. Precision means that when it sounds, you know what to look at, what you're looking at, and exactly how frightened you should be of it. Okay, so accuracy comes in three parts. Um, the first part is uh, talking about completeness, which is just the statement that if you're gonna look for bugs, you have to look everywhere. You can't leave any place unexamined where they can continue to hide. Um, now, the problem is that we can only have a finite number of test cases. They take resources to write. They take resources to maintain. They take time to run. And we need our unit tests to run quickly, right? Because they're a fundamental part of our development cycle. So how do we select our test cases, given that we can't run all possible data through our stuff? So um, I really like this book. Uh, this book by Glenford J. Myers uh, is the best book on testing I've seen so far. And a lot of what we're going to talk about was either taken from or heavily inspired by this. This book, by the way, you can tell is a, uh, is a little old. This was published in 79. And back then, he was talking about testing whole programs because they were smaller back then. So you have a program that's going to read a bunch of numbers off of a, punch, a stack of punch cards and sort them. It's the kind of thing he's talking about. But if you see past that, this book is fantastic. And um, he makes a strong case for, in our terms, maximizing the accuracy of our unit tests by maximizing the chances of finding a bug per test case. We can't test all possible inputs, but we can stack the deck in our favor. 
Now, there's a variety of techniques for going about this, and what we're going to start with is something called equivalence partitioning. An equivalence class is a set of inputs that all produce the same test result if you feed them into your code in a unit test. Um, they all trigger the same code paths. So if any one member of an equivalence class gives you a certain result, a pass or a fail, any other value from that class will do the same thing. So if you've identified uh, all the equivalence classes for your input and you write one test case for each one, you, in principle, have exercised all the paths through your code. Equivalence partitioning is the act of identifying equivalence classes. Let's do a little bit of that. Um, this is the simplest example I come up with. Uh, these are, are, what we're gonna do is take the absolute value of an integer, right? There's two code paths, this is easy enough. Now the input to this is just an integer. So the range of possible input values, which is the domain of the function, goes from int min to int max inclusive. By the way, in real code, int min and int max should be spelled standard numeric limits something, um, but that really doesn't fit on the slot. Now the return type is an integer. So in principle, all possible return values, that is all values supported by the return type, are technically called the codomain, which is also from, negative, uh, from int min to int max. Um, but the actual values we get out are gonna be the range. That is from zero up to int max. We're only gonna get zero or positive integers out. So based on looking at the code, it's fairly obvious that we have two equivalence classes here, at least at first glance. The first, we'll just call it equivalence class one. This goes from zero to int max inclusive. These are all the input values for which that conditional is false. We fall through to the second branch and we get back what we put in, right? That's an equivalence class. And the second equivalence class uh, is everything else. It's everything you can put in that will make that conditional true. You take the first branch and you get back the negative of what you sent in. Two equivalence classes. Now, if you were paying attention at Lisa Lippincott's talk back on Monday, you might already be a little concerned about that. But if you haven't spotted the problem, the next step or next several steps in the process will identify it for us, which is what they're there for. The idea here, though, is that if we pick one value, any value from each equivalence class, right, two test cases, we have thoroughly exercised our function. Now, we're not done yet. The next thing we have to do is go look at the boundaries, look for boundary conditions. And particularly for an equivalence class that represents a range of values, you always wanna go at least look at the edges to see if anything interesting happens because that's where behavior changes, or easy to make mistakes will creep in. Um, you might also look at values near the boundaries because if something interesting happens at the boundaries, maybe near the boundaries is where things start to get a little iffy. Um, so in our case, if we go look at uh, equivalence class one and we look at the boundaries and we look at uh, int max, if we feed int max into this function, does anything unusual happen? The answer is no, it does the same thing that any other positive integer does, no problem. We look at zero. You might think that zero would be an important uh, value to check in an absolute value function, but given the way it's written here, it just does the same thing that any other integer does. It makes that conditional false, and you take the second branch. You look at plus or minus one just to check, nothing interesting there, and then you go check int min and you realize that you have a problem. When you spell int min and int max properly, int min is negative 2,147,483,648, but int max is positive 2,147,483,647. Uh, right? This is what we heard about on Monday. Signed integers are not symmetric in range, so if I take the absolute value of int min, I'm gonna get undefined behavior because that is a signed integer overflow. So the point being is that we need to adjust our equivalence classes. That second equivalence class should not include int min, and int min should be in its own group somehow. Now as written, this is a narrow contract. So there's no point in writing a unit test for this because undefined behavior by definition has no correct behavior to look at. There's no point in testing out of contract input. But if we rewrite this to have a wide contract, so we do something like this, uh, so now we're going to actually check to see if someone has passed us int min and uh, thank you, Standards Committee, for giving us a standard domain error. That's exactly what this is. We'll throw an exception. 
all right? Now, equivalence class three, consisting only of it min, is an entirely legitimate and important test case. So now we have equivalence class one, zero up to int max, equivalence class two, int min to zero, not including either endpoint, and equivalence class three sitting here over, uh, over on the edge, and you should write a test case for that and make sure it throws the right kind of exception. We're still not done. Although most of the time this will get most of what you need to get. But now it's time to go back and look for just interesting values. Interesting as defined by, well, you. You know the algorithm, you wrote the code, you're the one who knows if something is interesting because something strange happens. Uh, Pete, real quick. Well, okay, um, yeah, so the question was, uh, if we discover that it min is a problem, but we can't unit test it, what do we do, more or less? So you can't write a unit test for it min with the original narrow contract, because if you try and do anything with it, you're just gonna get undefined behavior. You have to handle that in some other way. What you've got is a narrow contract that people can use wrong. That's a problem, but you can't fix that with your unit tests. Uh, the way to fix it is probably to go add uh, a wider contract to that so it can detect it. Okay, so interesting values are basically, well, it's not black magic. You know what's interesting. There's no defined procedure to go get these. This is simply your opinion because you're the expert. Um, so for example, if you think that zero is an interesting value to test in an absolute value function, make it an equivalence class and add a test for it. Presuming that you can afford to do so. Presuming that it's fairly easy to add it, it doesn't take long to run, and you can afford to maintain it. Um, but also consider that interesting in the eye of the beholder, right? We don't test our unit tests. Our unit tests are only proven true by inspection, which means they have to be readable, which means they're going to be read. So consider that future readers who think a given value is interesting might really like to see a test case for that so that they know that you've handled it properly. Even if you know that that value is really part of some equivalence class, you didn't really need it. This might be a very, very handy thing to do uh, for future maintenance and future readers. So either on the basis that it's a boundary or that it's interesting, we might uh, take zero out of equivalence class one and add it as its own, its own uh, equivalence class. So on this basis, we would have four test cases. Um, zero to int max, not including zero. Int min to zero, not including either end int min, make sure it throws an exception, zero, just to be sure. Now this brings up an interesting point though. Is what we have just done white box testing? Now uh, I talked about this again a whole lot last year, so uh, if you want more on white box versus black box, go watch that talk. Roughly black box testing means we're only going to examine the observable behavior of our code. Usually used when we're talking about testing classes. And this means that you're only allowed to test the public interface of a class. White box testing, on the other hand, means that in your unit tests, by some usually very nefarious means, you get into the guts of your class and your unit tests are reaching in and looking at the detailed behavior of the gears and the levers and the switches in there. And generally, this is not recommended because it means that your unit tests are tightly coupled to your implementation. If you refactor your implementation, you have to go fiddle with your unit tests, which can be somewhere between expensive and extremely expensive. So usually we don't like to do white box testing, but arguably we just did, because we derived our knowledge of these equivalence classes from a detailed examination of the code. We decided that zero didn't need to be in its own equivalence class just based on the way the code was written. So the question is, should we be doing this? And if the answer is yes, that means our equivalence class definitions may be tightly coupled to details of our implementation and might become wrong under a refactor. But if the answer is no, and we shouldn't look at the detailed implementation when we're doing this, then our unit tests are decoupled from our code, which is good, but maybe now you're likely to miss corner cases or that particular weird thing that your code looks at. So I don't have a good answer to this. I just bring up the question, you ought to think about this. I guess 
my personal feeling right now is that we should absolutely look into the details of the code because writing unit tests is hard as it is. Um, but I could be persuaded the other way. I think this is, this is an issue of debate. Okay, um, before we wrap up equivalence partitioning, oh, um, yeah, an example here. This example is simple enough that you actually can work your way back to these equivalence classes and identify these necessary test cases without looking at the code. Um, I don't claim you can always do this, but at least in this case you can, because now what you can do is instead you look at the range. You look at the interesting values in the range, you break it up into pieces, and you try to identify equivalence classes of input that produce the interesting things in your output. So for example, here, three obvious cases in the range, zero, int max, and all the stuff in the middle. So you start looking for what input values produce these interesting output values. The only input value that produces zero is zero. That's an equivalence class of its own. We kind of decided that earlier, just for different reasons. So uh, let's look at all the stuff between zero and int max. Um, put in a representative positive value. It comes back to you. Great, that's an equivalence class. Uh, zero to int max non-inclusive. Then you've got all the negative values, the corresponding negative values that will turn positive when it comes back to you. Equivalence class three. Int min to zero, or at least apparently. Then you look at int max, and you say, what values give me int max? Well, if I put int max in, I'll get int max out. Great, that isn't even an equivalence class of its own, handled by one of the earlier ones. And then you realize that putting in int min doesn't give you int max. Putting in int min plus one gives you int max. Aha. Again, we've identified that problematic case, and you know that int min is a problem, and you can go handle that however you were going to. So in this particularly simple case, you can do black box equivalence class identification, because you're not looking at the code. You're just looking at the observable behavior. So it's doable, might be harder. OK, so to wrap this up, uh, well, we have two, two more things to, to discuss. Here's a more complicated example, much more realistic example. How do you do this for something like a sort function? So the first point is any time you've got an input to your function that tells you how much work to do or how many elements to operate on, uh, either explicitly or here implicitly, right? It's just the size of the range. You're always going to have at least three equivalence classes immediately. Zero, one, and many. Zero because you know that that's always a case that people forget, right? One, because that's usually an interesting case about what you do to process that. And in most cases, two and up is all sort of one equivalence class. Any number in there is going to do the same thing to your code. It's no big deal. Now, in this case, again, maybe doing some white box inspection, if you're sorting using an algorithm that like uses a pivot, or you have to select some position in the range to do things with, you might want to try two on the basis that means that your pivot is either on the left or the right edge could be an interesting case that you should include. Having identified those, then you can go look at what values to send in. So your obvious case is just make some random integers, send them in, make sure it gets sorted. But then you should try things like, what if all my input values are the same value? What if they're already sorted? What if they're sorted backwards? All right, finally, what do you do if you have multiple input parameters? This example was going to be something about aliens and guns and ammunition, but that actually got fairly gruesome. So instead, we're going to about talk about feeding camels, which need camels, feed, and apparently motorcycles. Why not? I don't know. Sure. The point being is that you first go through each of your input parameters and try to identify the equivalence classes for those, which you usually can do. Um, both the, the happy cases and maybe any error cases. So maybe you've got one hump camels and two hump camels. You've got cheap feed and expensive feed. You've got the fast motorcycles and the broken motorcycles, whatever you've got. Now, in principle, the entire test suite is some uh, combinatorial uh, explosion of those, right? You do a direct product and you have to check every one of those. Actually, you don't. In the ideal case, uh, the particularly simple case, any test that tests a successful equivalence class in one of these is enough. You don't have to do any more. So for example, if each one of these has two successful equivalence classes, I can just write two test cases and I'm done. Now we know it's probably not that simple. One humped camels won't eat expensive camel feed 
or you need the fast motorcycles to go get the two hump camels or something, right? So you need to go look at for how these equivalence classes interact and break them up or recombine them to come up with the equivalence classes you need to test. But it's the same process. And you don't need, again, to test every combination of these. You just need the combinations that will exercise every path through your code. Okay, with equivalence partitioning. Uh, to wrap this up, um, by the way, this draws a lot of ire online. There are a lot of unhappy people. Now, it's the internet, so that was true anyway. Um, and a lot of what you read where people seem to be unhappy about this is really them being unhappy about what other people have written about this. And I have set myself up for that, comments below, um, because I've used the terminology here very, uh, very sloppily, just for reasons of time. Um, so I know that I'm gonna get all kinds of feedback for having used the terminology wrong. But also I think there's a lot of disappointment from way back because this didn't live up to its billing. I think people thought that this was some nice, rote, deterministic algorithm for going and finding all the things you needed to test and then you'd write all those test cases and you're good. And of course we know perfectly well it doesn't work like that. My take on this is that it is an excellent tool for identifying possible test cases. It doesn't actually tell you what to test. It actually doesn't answer any of your questions at all. Is this an equivalence class? It won't tell you. You have to decide that for yourself. But it's a great tool for making sure you're asking the right questions. And that's always the first step. Okay, let's go on to accuracy part two, correctness. This is much simpler. Um, obviously, we want our test cases to identify correct output as being correct, incorrect output as being incorrect, and errors as being handled appropriately. This also tends to bleed over into maintainability issues, which are a whole separate area of, uh, of unit testing discussion. And the obvious examples are things like you're testing your logger, which means that you write into your unit test something that's got a file and line number in it, and this breaks when you format your code, right? Or um, you're testing some kind of hashed container and you make unwarranted assumptions about what order they'll come out in. The people from Google always seem to be very, very concerned about this. I think maybe they use hashes. Um, I wanna look at a little bit more of a subtle issue. Say you've got some complicated mathematical thing you're computing. We've heard that this value pi is a good one that we should know something about. And so you come up with a first cut at computing that. Now, this version is okay. It's returning a float, a float, so as usual, you get about seven decimal places of accuracy. I've highlighted all the incorrect digits up there in yellow. So you go put a value into your unit test that's got some of those incorrect digits, but you put some error bounds on that, right? Some epsilon, and you're fine. Until someone goes off and writes a much better one, this is actually the right answer, because now we're returning a double, and your test breaks. By over-specifying the correct value, which we did up above because we put in more information than our code could actually give us, you are setting yourself to get false positives on correct code changes. This is lower accuracy. You're getting false alarms. But on the other hand, being too loose with your error bounds, like, oh, we'll only look at the first two or three decimal places is is not any better, because now someone can go write this, which is an absolutely terrible way of computing pi, um, and this will pass. So you've got a unit test that's gonna let bugs come through, which is not good. So the idea here is that your definition of correct in your unit test should contain only the information that your code actually produces or that you actually need. Consider that if you were trying to compute how much concrete to put in to, uh, some landscaping and you needed to compute pi for that, do you really need seven decimal places to figure out how much concrete you need? Probably not. Okay, now, part three of accuracy is making sure that your tests are valid. And um, <clears throat> these can look very similar to what we just looked at, right? This is just a continuation of that example. But you have to be careful of just setting yourself up to uh, having used circular logic and writing a non-falsifiable unit test that'll never fail. For example, if we're computing pi by computing the co uh, arc cosine of negative one, and in our unit test, we decide to come up with what the right answer is by computing the arc cosine of minus one, congratulations, we have just proven that the code we wrote is the code we wrote, right? This is non-falsifiable. This will, as written, never fail. It can't. So, by the way, don't laugh. 
in science, this happens all the time. This is a major thing. People will go off and design experiments and realize after the fact that they haven't learned anything. Uh, there was an example. This is called the Hawthorne effect. Uh, this was industrial ergonomic study in a factory outside of Chicago back in the 1925, I think, where um, they wanted to see what changing the light level in the factory would do to worker productivity. So they increased the light levels and the workers did more work. They decreased the light levels and the workers did more work. It didn't take them long to figure out that what was happening is that the workers knew that they were being watched, so they work harder, right? This is not a useful test. This happens all the time and you really need to be on guard against it, even if it kind of looks silly at first glance. Now I wanna contrast that with doing this, where you've come up with your values to put in your unit test from some external trusted source, like a subject matter expert, or maybe the MATLAB prototype that your math team has worked up. This is a great idea. In fact, when you're going from prototype to operational code, this is frequently one of the first unit tests you write. You take those test cases that the experts have been staring at, and you turn them into unit tests, because you know that your real code pretty much ought to be doing what that prototype did. So this is a great idea. Now in contrast with this, this is kind of that first case we looked at where I have put in a highly uh, detailed value to check against. I got this by running the code yesterday. Now, people will jump up and down and scream and tell you not to do this because, right, we have not proven that this value is correct or that our code is correct. But we have proven that it hasn't changed since yesterday. That's not a unit test, but it is an acceptance test and can be an absolute lifesaver. If you're wrangling some legacy code and you don't know what the function does, you don't know what the right answer is, but you kind of presume that what it spits out at you is correct because it's been in operations for a couple of years. This is better than nothing. You can at least write this into a unit test and go refactor the code so that you can do better tests and you can have some confidence you haven't broken something. So it's not that this has no value, just be aware that it isn't actually proving anything correct. Okay. So to roll up accuracy, the point of accuracy is that your unit test results match the reality of your code, bug or no bug. You need to test completely, you need to test correctly, and you need to have valid tests. No circular logic, no non-falsifiable statements. Let's go on to precision, which is a much simpler topic. Um, you will remember that we sort of had to fudge on this a little bit as far as a good definition. From a practical point of view, I think we can go with this. It's how fast can you go from we know there's a problem to we know what and where the problem is and what to start doing, right? The briefer this time, the more precise your test is because you're getting good information. Now, to drive the point home, let's go back to our intrepid colonial marines. This is towards the end of the movie. You'll notice that the number of humans involved is much, much lower than it was before. Okay, and this is where the tension is ratcheting up because the aliens are coming, and this is gonna be the big fight. This is the last stand. Seal the door. Hurry! Come on! Come on, get Go. back! Work fast! Cover your eyes, you. Don't look at the light. Movement. Signal's clean. Range 20 meters. They found a way in, something we missed. We didn't miss anything. 18. Equivalence partitioning. 17 Identify meters. your test something cases. Something under the floor, not in the plans. I don't know. 15 meters. Ripley? Definitely inside the barricades. Let's go. 13 meters. That's right outside the door. Hicks, Vasquez, get back. Man, this is a big signal. How you doing, Vasquez? Talk to me. Almost there. That's it. 12 meters, 11, 10. Then they're right on us. Nine meters. Remember, short controlled bursts. Eight meters. Seven. Six. Can't be, that's inside the room. It's reading right, man, look. Well, you're not reading it right. Five meters, man. Four. What the hell? Yeah, the room they're in has a drop ceiling. <clears throat> and I'm not showing you what happens next. Famous words, that can't be, that's inside the room, all right? Um, again, we have 
test equipment that has a high accuracy, it's right that there are bugs there. And it's actually got precision in one dimension. They're really four meters away. They're just not four meters that way. They're up there. This is a problem, as our heroes are about to find out. Okay, so when you're trying to make your unit test precise, the first rule is, because we need good information, is just to use a good unit test framework. Now, Amir uh, Kirsch did a great talk earlier this week, uh, Back to Basics Unit Testing, and he went into a lot of detail about how you arrange this. So I'm just going to point out that uh, a passing test produces little or no output. A failing test gives you a wealth of necessary information. You want to see the name of the test case, the name of the test suite, the assertion that failed, the value you expected, the value you got, the file and line number of where it happened. You need all that, and any decent unit test will give you this. Also, make sure that you're using that unit test framework well. Again, Amir had some great examples of this using, for example, in this case, uh, Google Tests macros to give you good errors. Not just assert that something is true because all it can tell you is, hey, the value I got was false, but asserting that two things are equal. So you see the values in the output. You can figure out what's going on very quickly. Demand this of your unit test framework. Accept nothing else. Don't roll your own. Some of the earliest talks about testing at CPPCon way back in 2014 from Matt Hargett, really he jumped up and down about this because back then unit test frameworks weren't as well known. Don't roll your own unless you're Phil Nash. He rolled his own and it turned into catch two. And so Phil can go roll his own. But don't do that. These are good. Go use them. Now the other part of precision is just about organization. Um, Consider this unit test. This example was actually inspired by Kate Gregory's great talk on emotional code. How many people have watched that? Go watch that talk. I demand that everyone who joins my team go watch that before they do anything else. Because she's talking about seeing things like this in code and being able to tell that the programmer who put this in was frightened at the time. An emotion that is appropriate to our example, okay? Someone maybe was just having one of those mornings where nothing is working right and you question your mental model of how computers work, and your colleagues come over and look over your shoulder and then it works, and then they walk away and it doesn't work anymore. We've all had those mornings, right? So someone may have put this in just for some very basic sanity checking and forgot to take it out later. But it's still in your unit test, and you can just consider, what are the chances that that fails because standard vector's default constructor is broken? What do you do if it does? Uh, I guess you write a DR against your library implementers. But really, the question is, what are the chances that that test fails and everything else works? Pretty much zero, right? So this is silly. We all agree this is silly, but what if I change it to be not standard vector, but some custom vector written by someone in your company? Now, it wouldn't be your team that has failed to test it, right? Because you guys are right. It's, it's that other team, those yahoos down the hall who don't write unit tests for their code, right? Um, but you're using their thing in your test, it might be entirely reasonable for you to write a unit test for their stuff because they don't. The point is, don't put it here. Because if their thing breaks, the test case that fails is your code. And that's the wrong place for it. You want to avoid red herrings. You want to be, avoid pointing in the wrong direction. They're really up there. So what you do is you pull that out if you need it and stick it somewhere else. I like to put these over somewhere. Most big projects have got a bunch of header files that do like platform stuff. If I'm on Windows, include this. Uh, define you know, what version of GCC am I using or something. I like to put this stuff over there on the basis it's a weird place for a unit test. So whatever breaks, it gets a lot of attention. But the point is you stick it somewhere else in some test case called external stuff. Um, that way, if only that fails, everyone knows exactly where to go look. It's their code. Now, it's much more likely that that fails and your stuff fails because your stuff uses it. But at least now you've got two signals, but one of them is pointing you in the right place. So at least after you sit and look at it for a while, you can figure out what's going on and go handle it. You want to organize your test cases in your test suites to point as clearly as possible at where the real problem is. Don't mix stuff because that just makes life confusing. Now, this brings up a very interesting point about mocks. Um, there are two competing schools of test-driven development, the Detroit School and the London School. I don't know mu that much about it, but here are a couple of good blog posts if you really care. Um, the point is, is that the Detroit or classicist school tends to do 
what we've been doing so far. That is the first case here, where uh, in our test code, we're using the real thing. We're using the real custom whatever. Uh, the Detroit school tends not to use test doubles unless absolutely necessary. They test using the real stuff, using the real external components. Whereas the mockist or London school mocks or test doubles everything. They want every other thing that you depend on to be some faked up or mocked version that you've written for the purpose. So the classicist school would say that we don't need line five, as we just decided, because it's tested elsewhere, or it ought to be. Whereas the mockist school says you don't need, uh, pardon me, you don't need line five because on line four, you're not using the thing written by those people down the hall. You're using a mock you wrote for the purpose. You see the difference. This, by the way, assumes you're testing your mocks. We'll come back to that. But this brings up the really interesting point, which is that using mocks or test doubles is basically an accuracy versus precision trade-off. Consider that if your class or the test you're writing to test your class uses some external thing, and that thing fails, its tests fail, and your tests fail. So that isn't as precise as we'd like it to be. You're getting two signals, one of which is wrong, and pointing you in the wrong direction. Whereas if you use a mock thing in your tests, and that thing fails, only its test case fail, yours don't. That's a more precise result. You have one result, and it's pointing you directly to where the problem is. So London or Maka schools are arguably more precise because you don't get as many red herrings. Test failures have a limited blast radius. But on the other hand, that reduces accuracy. If the thing you're using is the real thing in your test cases, you're testing against the real thing. If you're using a mock thing in your tests, you've only ever tested against a mock thing. And every difference in behavior between the mock and the real thing is just like the difference between the real ceiling and the drop ceiling, and the aliens are coming in between them. Right? Those are places where bugs can hide that you can't find in your unit test. Don't let them come in through the ceiling. Um, now, I don't have an opinion on this, and I know that many people out there do, and I'm staying out of it, but I just bring up the point that if you need an accuracy versus precision slider, this is one. By the way, have you tested your mocks? Um, consider that if you're gonna say that your test works, or your, your code works, because the tests of that code work with your mocks. You cannot therefore go say that your mocks work because they work with your tests, right? Don't do that, that's another circular logic problem. You need independent tests of your mocks. Okay, now, let's wrap up precision by just jumping up and down about one point. Let's go back to that clip and watch, just pay attention to the dialogue Six. here at the very end. It can't be, that's inside the room. It's reading right, man, look. Well, you're not reading it right. So, the problem here is that the people involved are getting contradictory input. Their highly trusted equipment says that there's an alien right over there. They're looking, and their eyes and ears say that there's no alien there. This is confusing. So you see them doing exactly what they should do. Hudson checks his thing. It's reading right. Hicks says, you're not reading it right. Ripley picks her own up to double check. Right? They're checking each other's work. And she does actually come up with the right answer, but boy, those three or four seconds could have been better used. Okay? The point is that humans are spectacularly bad at handling contradictory input, especially when some of it is coming in through our own sensory mechanism. Okay? Go look up uh, spatial disorientation in conjunction with pilots. It's a very dangerous condition. Um, in this case, maybe you're looking at your code, which is just fine, and you're looking at a test failure, which is saying your code isn't just fine. And these two things cannot both simultaneously exist in reality. It's a very confusing situation, and I'm willing to bet we've all been there. Now, if you're tackling this at 9 or 10 in the morning, you just got to the office, you're finishing up your latte, this is not a problem, right? You got all day, you can get, like, we do this all the time. Hey, that's odd, I'll go read the code and figure out what's going on. But keep in mind that humans are much, much worse at handling these conditions when they're tired or angry or frightened. As in our example. If you have to go track down something where your tests are failing but your code is right, at two in the morning, because you just got called in because something broke the night before delivery, 
and it's failing in your test case. So, and so your team is on the hook and you guys are all there and it's two in the morning and management is shouting at you. Or even worse, this is two in the morning after you released it and your biggest customer is on the phone and your vice president and the tech lead are gonna fly across the country to apologize to them. It is much, much harder to make sense of contradictory input under these circumstances. Do not confuse the tired, frightened, angry humans. Make your tests clear when they find a problem. All right, so to sum up, good tests are accurate and precise. In this context, accuracy means that the results of the test match the reality of the code. Maybe they don't show up on infrared at all is a bad situation. You want to avoid that. Precision means that the test output is useful. That can't be that's inside the room is a bad situation. You want to avoid that. So uh, in closing, what I want you to do, ideally Monday when you go back to your jobs, is to start armoring up your unit tests. Because we know that test bugs or bugs in software are a huge problem. It's one of the biggest problems we face in our industry. It costs money, it injures people under unfortunate circumstances. We all know that we need to do a better job of this. So I want you to go armor up because there are some bugs out there. Good luck, thank you. So we've got a little bit more time than I expected, so please come up with questions. Yes, sir. A question about your, I think you asserted that in the uh, multiple input case with the equivalence classes, mm -hmm. that you didn't need to test the combinatorial explosion of it. And I can see where you would test, get a lot of like maybe 80% usefulness out of not testing all of them, but that there are corner cases that you could miss oh, by yes. not testing them. Oh, absolutely. So, so you do need to go look very closely at the test cases you decide to keep. Because on the one hand, you're trying to avoid having 100 million test cases, because you can't, but on the other hand, you don't want to miss something. So this is where you have to look very closely, and you can either approach it as, I'm going to look at how equivalence classes interfere with each other, right? This success, pardon me, this success case for this input is not a success case if that input is three. So you have to go tackle that. Or the other way to look at it is to look at all the code paths and see where you've got code paths where you've got two uh, equivalence classes that are doing something, and then you have to break that out into a separate equivalence class. So now you get equivalence classes across all of your inputs. But the first step is to go identify on an input-by-input input basis, because that's just where you start the bug hunt from. But you're absolutely right. You need to be very careful to make sure that you are getting all of the code covered when you go do that. But the other point is you don't actually have to go do all billion of them. Good, thank you. Pete. Yes, I have one or two questions. So with this equivalent classes, it sounds like, you know, when you take a very limited case, you can sort of scientifically an analyze it. Mm -hmm. When you have something that's much more complex, right, or the unit test is bringing some other pieces of your units together, it's going to be a lot more difficult to find this equivalent class. Yes, it is. So why, why even bother? Why not just take, you know, a good old college try at it and let iteration figure out what's missing? <laughs> okay, so thank you. So uh, first of all, yeah, equivalence class partitioning is much more difficult in real life. I had to do simple things because, you know, I've only got six minutes left. Um, and if you go back to that second clip, when Ripley is saying to yourself, what did we miss? How did they get in? Yeah, right? Um, there are other places to get test cases from. I'm not saying that this is the only thing you have to do, okay? So for example, fuzz testing um, or reports from the field where people have found a bug, the first thing you do is add that to your set of unit tests. Someone found a chink in your armor. The fuzz test found it, or a customer found the hole in the armor where a bug had gotten through. Before you fix the bug, go fix up the armor. This is actually another, uh, that I didn't think I'd have time to talk about, aspect of um, being a good lab technician, calibrate your equipment. So before you go fix the bug, write the unit test that exposes the bug and make damn sure that it fails, then you fix the bug and you make damn sure that that fixed your unit test. Make sure that the test is actually testing what you just found. So yes, there are many other good places to get test cases from. Don't ignore them and just do this. This is just a good place to start. 
Okay, no. I have yeah. a second. I have a second one. So, mm -hmm. you talked about you know with the emotional coding, a, a useless test, and you'll get reports coming back from the field. So you'll pad out your testing as you as bugs show up. But what about the cleaning up of unit tests where there are useless tests, useless checks? Um, I would say if you were in a code review and you took that you know checking of the constructor out, yeah. you might get something. Hey, look. Um, there's no problem with having useless tests in there, like the more the merrier. So what's your opinion on the cleaning up of useless so time-consuming testing? So forgive the military analogy, but if you go back to the tank designers in World War II, they had the same problem. There's no, much th there's no such thing as too much armor on a tank up until the point you're, that your tank is so heavy it can't climb up a hill, right? Um, so. This is an engineering call. First of all, if you can take a unit test out and it doesn't change your test coverage, that is to say it was basically testing something that was tested elsewhere, then you can take it out just to save a little bit of compile time and a little bit of runtime. Generally a good idea, particularly if you're in that condition and things aren't well organized, go th going through and organizing them so you get higher precision will typically also find a bunch of stuff you didn't really need and you can take it out. What about a test that never fails? Is that a good test? <laughs> so a lot of people would say that that is not a good test. So Glenford J. Myers, my, my hero, that book that I put up earlier, um, would say that a test that never fails is not earning its keep, right? That's armor you don't need because clearly there's nothing over there. And I say, I, I agree, except that you know for a fact, as soon as you take out a unit test you think you don't need, that's what's gonna break tomorrow, right? But a test that cannot fail, absolutely you take those out. Those are just a waste of time. A test that is extremely unlikely to fail for whatever reason might be an engineering trade-off. If you take it off, you've actually opened a hole in your armor. But if you know for a fact nothing's going to come in that way, it might be worth it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Pete. Yes, sir. In the topic of the test that never fail, so a classic way, at least how I do it, is I literally put a bug in the code and check that my test is failing. But mm -hmm. then when I put the code review, clearly I don't check in the bug I, I inserted right. and everything is going to be green. But when I review someone else's code or when someone else reviews my code, there's no way for them to know that I checked and my test actually fails in case of the bug. Is there a way to kind of show this process so that we prove that our test actually fails? Yeah, so that's a good question. And, and by the way, that's, that's a very good point. Um, in some way or another, when you're writing test cases, you want to show the reviewers that they actually failed when they should be failing. So this is, again, the equivalent of um, calibrating your scale before you make an accurate measurement. Put a known quantity on the scale, which are typically very expensive, to make sure that it reads properly. That's basically what you're doing. Make sure that in the presence of a known signal, you get what you should get from the known signal. Um, the way we handle that, this is, this is more of a development process question. What I like to do in Git is we'll have a branch and I make my people um, rebase the branch and clean up their Git history. So ideally, over on the branch, there would be one check-in that says added bug or added unit test exposed bug and your CI pipeline for that check-in fails. And then the next check-in says fix the bug and that succeeds. And that ideally, people in your code reviews would be going and looking through your Git history and looking for this. But I think that, as far as I know, is only really handle handleable um, as part of your bigger development process to make sure that people are doing this and then to figure out how your code, review, your code reviewers can go verify that it really happened. But it's an excellent, excellent, pardon me, excellent idea. Any other questions? Oh, I see something online, yes. Yeah, S question from Daniel Murgett. Would you say that uh, there always is a trade-off between accuracy versus precision of how we write our unit test suites? Or can we, however hard that may be, achieve both at the same time? That's a good question. So my, my first thought was be, would be to say, well, yes, if we were better at this, we could get both accuracy and precision. But you can see with that mocking versus real thing example, you're sort of, you're, you're hosed either way. If your test, if your code under tests are using real things from elsewhere, you are vulnerable to failures there making your stuff fail. But if you don't use the real thing you're gonna use in production, you've got a problem. Right now I'm thinking that is 
kind of a fundamental conflict. And I don't know what to do about it other than just to tell people, be aware that that's the decision you're making. Whichever way is fine, just know that you're making it. Uh, or, <laughs> or, or do both and watch what happens. I guess you could if you've got the resources to do it. Okay, we are, uh, we are out of time. Thank you all for coming. Um, if we have more questions, um, I will be around, and you had my email earlier in the talk, so please email me uh, if we don't get to your questions. Thank you very much.